Many of you know Andrew. He is one of the founders of Patient Power, which is a health communications company. He's also the author of The Web Savvy Patient, an insider's guide to navigating the internet when facing medical crises. He's a CLL patient who's recently had his um, second treatment. So all of the panelists are going to be given about five minutes to talk about their advocacy. Not everybody's a patient, so it'll be an interesting panel. Um, Ingo's going to give the cutoff when they have a minute left, and then we're going to open uh, the floor to questions. So you can write your questions down. We'll have the microphones passed. So Andrew, if you'd like to start. Uh, sure. So uh, first of all, I was diagnosed with CLL through a routine blood test in 1996. That's a really long time ago, right? And here I am, and, uh, and Dr. Lamanis Aster and I jogging along the walk. So I mean, we've led a full life, and I'm very grateful for that. I was in the phase two trial when it all started at MD Anderson at a, in Houston, Texas, as a single center, right? And I think I was patient number 60. So uh, those of you who get FCR, for better, for worse, I hope only for better, I've been there, and, um, and yet, and a woman asked us in the elevator, I, Esther and I were still jogging during treatment, and I went to work every day, and so don't be afraid of it. Everybody has their own journey, but it worked out. I had a 17-year remission. Dr. Kipps is my doctor. Last summer he said, you know, your white count had been going like this, and now it's going like that. And, uh, and so I had a second treatment called Gaziva or abinutuzumab. Uh, what did you call it, uh, Dr. Kipps, rituxin with an attitude? Uh, so I had that, his particular approach, and he could explain this to you individually or in the panel, he uses, for some people, some high-dose steroids. So yeah, I had some nights when I didn't sleep so well or, you know, but it worked out fine. And now all the counts normalized again. So I'm someone who's gone through retreatment. The other thing I'd like to talk about is it, it relates to what we were just saying with uh, Lisa. So uh, when I was diagnosed with CLL, Esther and I were already doing patient education programs using our journalism and communications backgrounds. So we said, why not CLL? So in 1996, when I was diagnosed, we did an audio webcast with Dr. Rye, and you saw the Rye staging system. He's sort of the grand old man of CLL, devoted to us for like centuries, it seems. Uh, and uh, he's a wonderful guy, right? And just a wonderful man. And then Dr. Michael Keating, who became my doctor at MD Anderson, who among some others was maybe the, you can debate it, the father of FCR. So, um, we started doing webcasts. And some of you, I hope you didn't need us in 1996, but we started doing these audio programs, and then that became video programs, and that became town meetings in Europe as well as in the US, and broadcasting on the website, patientpower.info. And for those of you who trust Mark Zuckerberg, um, we are on Facebook too with something called the Cancer Connection, and people come together. But the point is, we wanted to use our journalism and communication skills to be like a news network for you. And so we worked with Deborah and the PAG team for many years, and we did some interviews. There'll be one with Dr. Kipps and one with Dr. Lamana and others we may do. And one last story I just want to tell about advocacy, because advocacy can be you just talking to other people. Samantha, could you stand up for just a second? I'm going to embarrass her. This is Samantha Bonilla. What, where do you live here in Canada? I'm from Hamilton, but I live out by Port Dover, about an hour from Okay, Port Dover. She knows where it is, I don't know where it is, you know where it is. <laughs> okay, thank you. So Esther and I were in Ecuador about two months ago at a little, tiny little hostel at a dinner table, and there were several in the mountains really far out. And this woman is next to me and we're talking, how are you doing, you've been hiking? She said, well, I get a lot of fatigue. And we said, oh, why do you get fatigued? She said, well, I have this leukemia, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. <laughs> but you've probably never heard of it. And I said, <laughs> I said, I have it. Samantha started crying because she'd never met another person with CLL. And I said, 
there's a big conference coming up and it's near where you live. You better come. So there she is, and now you have all these friends, Samantha. So, so that's my story. So I'm delighted to be here. Don't be afraid of retreatment. It's Dr. Kipps has shaped me up again. I have to go many more years, many more jogs, and back at Niagara Falls, and it's a delight to be with you. Lorna, we'll go with you next. Lorna is not a patient, but she is a member of the CLL PAG board. I first met Lorna in uh, 1990, no, sorry, 2006, um, when we formed a committee for the first CLL conference. And she's worked on all five conferences with me, sometimes as a representative of a blood cancer charity, but also as a volunteer. Recently, she was made the chair of a new advocacy group, an international advocacy group for CLL called CLL Advocates Network. And it brings groups from all over the world together uh, to support CLL. I think you're now vice chair. No, you're still chair? Okay, so Lorna will tell us a little bit about her advocacy for CLL patients as a non-patient. So it is my pleasure to be here, and yes, I have been at every conference since they started, and it is every year when we start planning these, we're like, oh my gosh, this is so much work. <laughs> and then we get to the events like this, and it's just so rewarding when we see how well it all comes together and how much everyone gets out of them. So Deborah is actually one of the reasons I got heavily involved in CLL. So I have worked in blood cancers through different charities for 15 years. So I have a lot of experience right across the spectrum. But she lured me in, along with a friend of hers at the time, into helping with this conference and then got me more and more engaged in helping with CLL patient advocacy group. And then even when I got involved with the CLL Advocates Network, she lured me in and then she backed out. So I had to do the work. <laughs> She's very smart. So uh, what we do when we're advocating is actually a lot of what we're looking at is system level advocate. So where, where um, you have people like Andrew who are doing videos and helping get you good information about what's going on, we're trying to get people access to drugs, right, for the most part, and access to testing, and create some equality across the globe for patients in terms of information and support, so that everybody has kind of a baseline that they're starting with. And we do that through working with patient groups globally. So, you know, when I say globally, I work, my, our latest patient group that joined the CLL Advocates Network is from Armenia. So we really are a global initiative. And when, um, I want to really encourage, when you get those surveys, and you, I know sometimes you get survey fatigue because you get a lot of surveys and people are saying, hey, explain again your patient experience with CLL. They really are valuable. So even though those surveys may come from Canada and we get some really great information, um, those surveys are used worldwide. So the survey that, for instance, because we were talking about venetoclax and it was the most recent uh, initiative that we did with CLL, that data was used in Israel, it was used in the Czech Republic, it was used in the UK, it was used in France, it was used in countries around the world. So you actually contributed not only to getting venetoclax access in Canada, you contributed to getting venetoclax access in a, a wide range of other countries globally. And that's because not every patient group or every organization is equipped to kind of gather that information, analyze it in a way that uh, the people who make those decisions at the higher levels within, within the countries uh, would like to see it and be able to analyze it. So when you have the strength of organizations like CLL PEG and Lymphoma Canada that will pull this kind of information together, it does make a difference to a lot of other places where they can't get the information or can't analyze it in a way that their local countries will respect. So I do really want to encourage you, even if you have survey fatigue, to keep filling those out because they really do make a difference. And the other thing is when we're looking at, um, from a global perspective, 
it's amazing because we have this conference and you're getting um, exposure to these fabulous CLL experts that have come in from Canada and the US and they're willing to answer your questions one-on-one and sit down with you. But there are a lot of places in the world where they don't have a CLL expert in their country, never mind someone who would be available to um, a multitude of patients on, on a level like this. So we have a lot of countries where it is a local oncologist who's treating CLL. And when you look at the whole range of cancers that are out there, CLL is not that prevalent, right? So they're getting treated by someone who may not have good knowledge. And nurses um, are not treated with the same respect or value in every country. So it's not like they, they're getting good information from their nurses, which we highly value the support of our nursing teams. Um, in some countries, they really are treated as their doctor's assistant. So we are also working with nursing groups to try and raise their profile and make sure that they're treated as a valued member of the team that can provide extra support to patients. And a lot of this comes down for the fact that we know that patients that are informed and are confident in being a partner in their healthcare decisions report having better outcomes. So we want to make sure that our patients are as informed as possible and have good information so that when you're participating in that decision-making process with your medical team, you feel like you know, if you don't know the information yourself, you know where to go and get it. You know who to talk to, you know what your sources of information are, good credible information, so that you can make really good decisions for yourself. So that's where we focus. Thanks, Lorna. We're going to pass the mic to Mark Silverstone now. And I first met Mark at the last CLL Live conference, and he was pre-treatment then, so he has quite a story to tell uh, about how he's become a self-advocate and a patient advocate. Thank you. Uh, as Mark Silverstein, and uh, uh, I would guess I'll start with my diagnosis and my CLL adventure. And uh, it started with some, some enlarged lymph nodes that led to a couple of biopsies, which led to, in December 2010, um, a diagnosis of CLL. I went into FCR in January 2011, so it was really quick. Um, I was pretty, already pretty sick at the time. Um, my FCR lasted for about two and a half years, and in 2014, at the end of the year, I started relapsing again. Went into watch and wait more for my own needs of my chess game of time and putting off, uh, putting off treatment until I could, until I absolutely had to. Um, started ibrutinib, it lasted 14 months. I started relapsing again in 2016. Um, Wound up in the hospital for the first time for three weeks. My white counts were at 400,000. I had put on 20 pounds of fluids on my legs. I was certainly the biggest person I, I've ever been. Um, my wife always laughs that when uh, we came, uh, my doctor sent us home uh, just to get some stuff to go back to the hospital. I decided to try to put my skinny jeans on with 20 pounds on my legs. So we always joke about that. Um, anyways, I started. Uh, getting administered venetoclax, which took some time to really take hold. And it was the first time I heard my hematologist say that, that he was concerned and that you know, we might be in trouble. And my wife and I kind of said goodbye to each other a couple of times, but thankfully venetoclax started, started working for me. And um, because of my knowledge base, because that's what I was going to talk about a little bit as, as, as being a self-advocate, because I knew what I, you know, I'd read a lot. I suggested to my hematologist that we, uh, we introduce rituximab as a combo with the venetoclax. And because we've also talked um, about how aggressive my cancer was and how stubborn it seemed, uh, it was time for transplant. And so between rituximab and venetoclax, I got my counts down to normal. Um, I only had about 30 to 40 percent of CLL in my bone marrow and I just had a stem cell transplant this past November, so I'm on day 166. And, uh, and it, has been, it has been a ride, and, uh, but um, bone marrow, my bone marrow biopsy at day 60 was no CLL in my bone marrow, and my latest CT scan was none of my nodes were, all my nodes were normal, so for now, I know it's a marathon, so I can't say for sure I'm good, but it's going in the right direction. So when I was asked to do this, I kind of looked up the, uh, the definition of health advocacy and it sort of, it kind of related to 
assisting individuals as well as the greater advocacy in the public realm. And, and I was thinking about it, and, and, and to my mind, I've, I've been advocating since the beginning because it was, began with self-advocacy, and I think that's one of the most important things in regards to being sick is learning as much as you can. Um, you know, I, I under, tried to understand what 17P meant because that's what I am. I'm unmutated. Um, I tried to understand all the aspects of my disease and then understand the treatment landscape. As I said, it's kind of a chess game to me. And so I could kind of understand what choices I had beyond what my hematologist said. And so, you know, the second part of that is, is as Lorna said, is being, being a partner with your hematologist. It's your life. It's your survival. And I think it's really important to take a stand. And my hematologist is great. I've told them many times I'd love to have a t-shirt saying, I love my hematologist. <laughs> uh, his name is Peter, Dr. Peter Anglin, and he's a great guy. And he has the personality and the patience to sit down for me every single time I come in. We talk about things. We plan things out. It's not just about, Mark, you do this, you do that. Um, I got a minute thing, so I'll just kind of go a quicker. Um, my, my experience after, after treatment, especially FCR, was the emotional and spiritual um, effect of everything. And so I went back to school to become a psychotherapist. And so from my perspective, you know, once again, at supporting the individual, I've worked really hard with, um, with, with trying to work with cancer patients. I co-facilitate a support group at a local hospice. I created my own support program, or wellness program, for uh, palliative care individuals. Um, so I've, uh, I've, I've spent you know, a year walking someone sort of to their death and helping them out stress-wise, psychologically, etc. cetera. Um, so advocating you know, is not just on the big scale, although I have recently done more of the bigger stuff, and perhaps I'll get into that later, but um, it's also the small things. It's helping the individual, it's helping yourself first, and then it's just, you know, every person you touch that you help is someone that you helped. And that's, that's all that counts. And so, you know, that's really to me what advocacy is really all about. Thanks, Mark. And now I'd like to introduce Marcin Heinrichs. Marcin is the author of a newsletter called Living Well with CLL. And some of you may subscribe to it. Um, she's very low profile, so I'm so glad she agreed to coming with my encouragement. So Marcine, can you tell us your story? Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, it's only because of Deborah that I'm up here. I'm much more uh, comfortable behind my laptop than I am on a stage. When I was diagnosed, um, it was 2006, and I remember three things that my oncologist told me. One was the name of CLL. That was incurable and um, easy to treat, which I question now. <laughs> and actually a fourth thing, he said, don't Google. <laughs> so he may have meant that as a stop sign, but I took it as a green light. <laughs> I raced home and Googled day and night. I kept Dr. Google up quite a bit late at night, too. My husband didn't always know. <laughs> but as I read about CLL, I became confused. Rather than having it clear in my mind, it just seemed so strange. It wasn't like any other cancer that I knew about or heard about. And I frankly didn't believe what I read. Um, and I know now that some of those were reputable sources, but I even doubted the scientists. I thought, this just doesn't sound like something that makes sense. So um, I was prepared to throw out everything and start from scratch and didn't know where to turn. And then I met Sharon Pauls from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in BC. She came alongside and she showed me her materials. Well, I just, it was a veritable buffet of information and I just, just feasted on it. And um, in time, I became more comfortable online. And so she helped me draw up a newsletter sign-up sheet that I took to the BC Cancer Agency conference to take to a CLL breakout session. 
And lo and behold, 15 or 20 brave souls signed up. And that was 10 years ago. So by then, I knew more about some of the resources. And so there was patient power. There was uh, CLL PAG, um, ACOR, and so many excellent resources that it just kind of kept growing. It's usually around three or four pages. But it shows the interviews that Andrew has, um, articles. Chris Dwyer puts them up on Health Unlocked. He's an encyclopedia of CLL. It's, he's amazing. There are so many good resources out there. It just seems like they need to be ready, readily available. And I would really encourage everyone to sign up and to register for Patient Power and CLL Society and Health Unlocked and all of those. Get directly involved with those and get on the chat forums. There are so many smart lay people out there who will help you get ready for your appointments and explain sort of what to ask and help to um, make the best use of that appointment time. So uh, it's something I do on my own, but I wouldn't do it alone. Sharon Pauls has stood by me these 10 years as an advisor, and she's just been a really great support. So it's been an interesting journey. Oh, and along with the newsletter, I usually send out a diversion, which is on a light topic, maybe a YouTube video, um, or something inspirational, just to change the tone. Thanks, Marcy. Now, the resources that Marcine has mentioned are all on the CLL resource page. So if you don't have a copy of it yet, it's available at our booth out in the lobby. Are there questions that we can start with from the audience? Oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> oh, Wayne, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, um, Wayne, we'll ask you to wait while this, uh, this woman speaks. Andrew, when you were talking about traveling to Ecuador, um, that's one of the ways that my life has changed. I don't go to any third world countries. Um, what precautions do you take when you travel? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Dr. Kipps had me have a, uh, we had a frank discussion. We looked at how I was doing. Um, I take IVIG per his request every month. So I get the infusion. Maybe there's some people I think are getting it, sub-Q, Debris, some other people. So he wanted me to be fortified on top of good counts. And, um, and then also I have a little uh, safety packet of antibiotics he has me take with me when I travel. And for certain signs, you know, start that. So, but you know, Esther and I had a, we, we said, if not now, when? I mean, I was stable, I was doing well. I don't know if anybody's ever been to the Galapagos Islands, I'd recommend it. You can see the blue-footed booby, <laughs> those birds with little blue feet. But, um, and then we were up in the mountains where Samantha was. So we're committed to traveling. In other words, you, in consultation with your doctor, have to get your CLL in a manageable, controlled place. And hopefully you will, and Marquette is certainly a long journey to do that. But please, God, Mark's going to be able to do that. He's going to be confident. And when you are confident with your doctor, I'd say go for it. Don't, don't, don't be afraid. You need to know where the medical resources are, though, okay? And certainly maybe you should have medical evacuation insurance should you need that. That's a smart thing, too, if you need to get back to wherever. But uh, we're glad we did it, and we're planning to go to other places. I'm not planning to go to the most third world countries. Esther and I, next, anybody know anybody in New Zealand? That's where we want to go next. Okay. <laughs> That's not a third world country. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I think Wayne was next, and then we'll pass the mic to you guys. Well, it's pretty exciting to be here, and certain, certainly patient stories are, are wonderful. And because we're in an era of moving into more oral drugs that have to be taken every day without the expectation of a cure, 
my question to the panel uh, involved in this, how do you feel about this? Uh, how do you feel about the new oral drugs that are coming along? What are your concerns? And the reason that I'm asking is because I've been invited to uh, interface with a drug company coming out with some new uh, pipeline drugs. And so I would love to have uh, patient input, and I couldn't think of any, anybody better than some of the patients to, that are on this panel and have dealt with um, both infusion and, and, and oral drugs. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Wayne. I think Mark is the only one qualified to answer that. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, all I can say is, I, I, you know, as, as I alluded to before, it's a bit of a chess game for me, and it was always kind of, you know, if I, you know, I understood from the very beginning that this was a chronic cancer that will come back. It was the expectation is you're always sitting there waiting, not sitting there waiting, but understood that it would always come back. I was fortunate that every time it has relapsed. I've had a new oral targeted therapy available. Once I found out I was 17P, which was uh, on my first relapse, um, you know, Ibrutinib was just available like, like three months prior on compassionate grounds for 17P. Um, and the same thing again occurred um, with Venetoclax. It was three or four months prior that, that it was available on compassionate terms. So, I mean, I've been fortunate. I'm grateful for them. Um, they each had their own um, effects on, you know, side effects um, that I won't necessarily get into. But, but all I can say is I'm grateful, and and you know, I, I still plan ahead. You know, I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure that that my cu I'm cured from, you know, through the stem cell. So I'm still thinking ahead. I'm thinking ahead to, you know, will CAR-T work on someone with, who's had already had stem cell? You know, what other drugs are coming down the pipeline? So, so once again, I mean, compared to, I like to call it chemical warfare on your body, which is FCR, um, you know, the other drugs are just a little lighter, a little easier, a little simpler. Um, they take a little less from you. Um, and so I, I've always been grateful for them. I hope that helped. Thanks, Mark. Dark Can I just add really quickly one thing? Even though we've had huge advances in CLL, I just like to reiterate we're not done. It, we still have lots of work to do. So every time something new comes into the forefront, it's great because this is still a marathon for most people, right? So new science is still needed. We still need these clinical trials so we can find some new therapies until we find that one that is actually curative for most people, and we're not quite there yet. So um, keep participating in those clinical trials and embracing those new therapies so we can learn more knowledge and actually hopefully find something curative. I just want to say one thing about oral therapy. I don't take it for CLL. I developed another <coughs> condition, excuse me, called myelofibrosis, which is scarring in the bone marrow. Whether it was my luck in having a second cancer or related to the FCR 17 years earlier, we don't know. But I take a oral therapy, not unlike some of these others. Always remember to take your medicine. You know, believe it or not, and we saw this in another leukemia, CML, where people would start cutting pills, maybe for expense, or they'd forget because they felt so good. Never forget. I always do it morning and night. The other thing I was going to say, though, is hopefully as there are more oral medicines, and Wayne, whatever we can do to get more, can bring the cost down. In Canada, that may mean greater access because the provinces and the federal government will say we can afford it. And the second thing, and in the U.S. as well, and then lastly, uh, Dr. Kipps mentioned it, there are some patients on venetoclax, for instance, who have been able to stop for a time or an extended time. And that's where we want to get, where those of us who had FCR, we're done, hopefully for a long time. Hopefully there are pills that we'll be able to take that will produce such a result as well. We hope so. Thanks, Andrew. No, my, my question is, is stem cell taking the place of uh, bone marrow transplants? It, it, it's, just, it's the same thing. It's just, they're just two different, two different ways of saying it, but it, it is the same thing. You know, and it's something that, that um, you know, I remember hearing from like almost one of the first times I met with my hematologist talking about stem cell. 
Um, and I know uh, we've seen Christine, Dr. Christine Chen down at uh, Princess Margaret, and she's talked about it more than a couple of times, but we we're always really wary of it, and it's a scary procedure, and, uh, um, but you know, there comes a time, once again, this goes back to understanding your disease, too, is there comes a time when you, you understand that, you know, the way I, I relapsed off Ibrutinib, um, it was, it was strong, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was crazy and it was scary and it was quick. And I understood that even if venetoclax, you know, I thought venetoclax did a great job for me and especially the combination of rituximab and venetoclax. But you know, sooner or later I was gonna relapse. It was just a matter of time. And so, and if I relapsed and there wasn't something there, then I was in a lot of trouble. And so it was just came down to, it was kind of like CAR-T or stem cell, but because we're in Canada and CAR-T is not very available, and it would have been a huge expense. You know, we went for stem cell, and um, and you know, so far so good. That's all I can say. Um, so, if if somebody is living in an, in a in a region, for example, where they don't have access to a CLL uh, focused doctor, what are the models out there where we can kind of have our local uh, cancer doctor maybe collaborate with someone else? another doctor remotely to be able to have that specialty um, kind of, or this expertise kind of transferred to the patient? I think Lorna. So in Canada, I think Versha um, spoke a little bit about this yesterday, but I don't remember if she said it to the group or to me personally. Um, but I do think she was talked a little bit about it to the group where they do actually do teleconsultations, right? So um, they do move some patients around if necessary in Canada so they can see a specialist. So if you're living in a far remote space, you can uh, fly in with uh, medical support to get into a center for treatment and for care from a specialist. And if it's ongoing care that's happening in a remote location, then they do do telehealth. So you talk to a specialist through an iPad, for instance, and you're, you know, they do their exams that way along with a local doctor who could uh, help with that. So there are opportunities within Canada where that is uh, being addressed. We see it in the north all the time. Um, when you're looking in other countries, it gets a little more tricky. If, uh, uh, so we are looking, at, uh, for instance, if you're in some places in Eastern Europe, for instance, you, get, you can, if, the, um, if you're all part of the European Union, there's a chance that you can fly to another country within the European Union for care, as long as you get both governments to agree. But sometimes timing becomes an issue and we've had patients by the time that they're actually able to get their approvals and fly to another country to get the support they needed that the doctor who agreed to see them in the receiving country will no longer treat them because their cancer has become too far advanced because of the delays in getting them there. So that is one issue we're still looking at and we actually work with some medical groups to figure out how can we help make this better for people. Um, Canada actually has a really good medical system, and I am not going to say it's perfect. It certainly is not, and it still needs a lot of support, and we will continue to fight to, to get a better system for people in Canada, uh, but it's better than a lot of places, right, where they don't have access to standard therapy. So it's not a case of getting them access to a Brutinib. Um, it's a case of getting them access to FCR. So, um, and if you don't have the doctor who knows how to manage one of the new therapies, it's more than getting them access to the drug, right? And if they don't have the tests or the testing equipment to be able to do the test, then there are some fundamental differences in the systems that need to be addressed. So we work at very different levels in those countries to see how we can move the bar. We can have a really good discussion about that offline if you want to. Just two quick stories. First of all, so I was diagnosed in Seattle, Washington in uh, an HMO, they call it Health Maintenance Organization, and dear Dr. Feldman had to treat every cancer for anybody in the group, 500,000 people. And so obviously, he, most of the people he knew uh, with CLL were in their 70s, I was 45. At that time in 1996, it was fludarabine by itself, or sometimes fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. And so what happened, and this relates to advocacy, 
you mentioned, uh, Marcin, you mentioned the ACOR.org list. That was the very early patient-to-patient -patient communication on ACOR.org. There was a woman named Granny Barb Lackritz who led it, woman from St. Louis. And Esther and I went on it, found her on the computer in 1996, and they said, you need to get to a CLL specialist. So on our own, we went to, at that time, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, where Dr. Keating and others were. And we said to Dr. Feldman, the general oncologist, well, we're gonna go to see the CLL specialist. He said, well, why are you doing that? I know what they're gonna say. Well, guess what, he didn't. And that's what led me eventually to the phase two trial for FCR. But what happened was I became the um, catalyst for a partnership between Dr. Feldman and Dr. Keating. And so I was treated, Dr. Feldman was in a video we made about it, et cetera. And then later I said, Dr. Feldman, how are you treating other patients with CLL? He said, oh, same as you. I learned from your experience. So it may be, depending on where you are and in the remote reaches of Canada, wherever you see a community doctor, may be that you're the bridge. And then one other quick story, there's a woman named Jan Rin who has CLL in Dublin, Ireland. And she was really sick. And Ireland's not a big country, you know, and doesn't have a lot of resources. And she and her husband, uh, Michael, did research and found out there was a CLL trial in Leeds. And you all can guess who the doctor is in Leeds. And it was for a brutnip for the national health system in the UK. But Ireland is a separate country. And they raised hell can Jan go to Leeds to be in that trial? And they worked it out. They got the Irish government to kick in some money, and they got the, um, the uh, national health system in the UK to accept them. And guess what? She's doing great. But does anybody know Yiddish, the word chutzpah? So you need that push, you know, and that's what Jan and Michael did. Question for Marcine. Um, your newsletter, what kind of topics do you cover? Thanks, Peter. Uh, it starts with what's up. There are four segments to it, and it starts with what's up, which is announcing various events that have broad interest. And then it's what's new from the experts. And so Dr. Lamana is on there quite often, Dr. Kipps. Um, and those people who are in the, at the forefront of where CLL is going. Uh, these are videos and also short articles. And it's a series of links. The newsletter isn't meant to be read all the way through. It's a list of links that are given titles so you can see by the titles what that video or that article is about. The um, third segment is what else is new. And that's research, um, pharmaceutical news, and then health tips, general health tips. With immune system problems, we have a lot of different um, opportunities to hear about what's healthy, what's risky. And so there are articles about that. And then the last segment is soul support. And for me, a CLL diagnosis was a real lurch in life. I struggled with a watch and wait. Other things piled onto the diagnosis, and I went through a dark time. So I believe uh, support for the soul is really important. And uh, I hear that from Mark, too. So it is um, links that relate to psychological support, emotional, um, sometimes spirit or heart. I believe a lot of how, how we cope comes from that level and that we need to be mindful that a CLL diagnosis isn't just a physical burden, it's a psychological burden. And it's ongoing. We wear it for the rest of our lives. So we need to think about that part of us that helps us cope. Um, I think that covers it, Peter. But Marcy, how do you get the newsletter? Did you say that it's on the list? No, it's you wouldn't, it's not you wouldn't on let the it be list. on the list. <laughs> Um, I think the, my email was going to be on the screen or something. I, I don't think we agreed to that, but if you okay. email 
CLL PAG. We'll put it on our, um, we will email it out to you from CLL PAG. Okay, um, it's basically my name. Marcine is M A R C Y N E, initial H, at Gmail. And if you ask for it, just um, give your name, your email, of course, and then your general location helps me because I have different batches for different locations. And if you want to say something about your diagnosis and something about yourself, I'm interested in that. Um, I enjoy one-on-one -on -one connection. Yeah. Great. That's gmail.com at the end. Marcin, can you maybe tell us about some of the feedback that you've had about the newsletter? Feedback. It's been really gratifying, and I've been surprised at the broad interest. Um, a lot of people, we've talked about this, feel a bit alienated because of distance from support and doctors. And so it's actually on five continents, and that's, that's been really exciting for me. But I think another surprise has been what it's done for me. Um, it really helped me to focus on others and to get out of this, this grind of, you know, what's tomorrow, what's, what's in front of me, to focus on others and help others cope. Um, so it's been, it's been really gratifying. And I think, too, as we do that, we nourish the soul because we are, we are reaching out and we are focusing on others. Uh, uh, Dr. Kaufman says, um, as we help others, we help ourselves, and that's true. Thank you. Okay. Oops, sorry. Uh, this oh, is. Oh, could I underscore just one thing right she ahead. mentioned, and maybe Mark will get to talk about it too. So, you were just mentioning about the emotional aspect of it. So I thought I was dead at age 45. I wasn't. Right here I am. And many of you, either care caregivers or uh, patients you feel you have this thing and you haven't, you can't cut it out. Maybe Mark, please God, will be cured or there'll be other curative strategies, but otherwise you feel it's always there and it can just weigh you down. And you've got to get past that and there are people who can help you. Some of it is here. Some of it is you get up in the morning and say, I have today, what am I going to do with it, right? And some of you also are very hesitant to talk about it. We're real public about it. And I will just say by speaking about it for me, it's lifted that weight, right? People don't get it, they compare it with other cancers, they don't have a frame of reference. I talk about it and that's helped me a lot. And so I'd, I'd urge you to consider that, speaking about it, your kids, your grandkids, let them know here you are and live a full life and then go on and do what you wanna do and we're here to support you. Thanks, Andrew. I guess. From a therapeutic perspective, that makes perfect sense. Um, the more you keep down, the, the harder and more stressful it is on, on you and, and the effect it has. Um, I would also suggest, although it is hard to kind of wrap your head around, but you know, the diagnosis can also be a bit of a gift. Um, there's an opportunity for learning and transformation. Understanding that you're going to Understanding you're going to die in a way that you didn't understand before really helps you be present, helps you make better choices, um, helps you, you know, helps you remove, you know, the thought of understanding you're going to die also helps you remove fear from your choices, and that way you make better choices. Um, so it really is, if you can kind of grasp that and live with it, it, it actually is, is, it could be, you know, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, without sounding ridiculous, it could be actually a great thing, the, what you get from it. My wife and I, our closeness, what we understand, what's important to us, the amount of, you know, what, what has meaning for us, what we value has become so different. And, and, to, and to be able to kind of attach to that and live your life differently, it's really, it can be an opportunity. It's not just a diagnosis. Yeah, I think we'd all agree with that. I think we have time for one more question down there. Yes, uh, for those of you who have gone through it, could you explain what FCR feels like? Because for a lot of us that haven't done it yet, it's like this room that people go in, but we have no idea what actually happens. Um, 
I guess Andrew and I could probably both speak to that. Um, Not quarter two? Um, FCR, for me, honestly, I mean, I was 45 when I was diagnosed, so I was fairly young, and uh, um, it, wasn't really, it wasn't really in my blood at that time, so I re more had SLL, it was presenting in my lymph nodes and my bone marrow, but not in my blood. Um, you know, it, it's a cumulative effect, so the first couple of rounds weren't too bad. As time went on, it got worse. You know, I got more tired. Um, you know, there was two, three, four days of, of just lying in bed still without wanting to move, um, being really nauseous, not eating well, etc. And, you know, it's kind of two weeks of really feeling bad and then two weeks of kind of getting better and then starting all over again. Um, you know, it's some of the after effects is really kind of, you know, you have your head, you know, you, from my perspective, you kind of put your game face on when you're going through something like FCR and you kind of put your head down. And as soon as you kind of get out of it, that's when you realize what you've been through. And there's the side of the cognitive side effects of chemo brain, um, you know, fatigue, um, all sorts of little things that took time to go away. I'm not sure the cognitive ones all went away, but, but uh, um, it, you know, it, can, it was challenging in its own way, but I guess... Compared to some people I've read about, I, I probably had a, a fairly good time with it, com, you know, compared to some. Uh, I'll be frank about it. So first of all, I don't know if the way it's administered has changed. So I had in, in 2000, so 18 years ago. But I will say this much, and very much like Mark. Um, first of all, I kept working. I s still was able to jog some with Esther, not as far. Uh, or as fast, certainly, but we kept on doing it. I did, nausea was a problem for me that became progressive usually in later cycles, and I know the medicines have improved remarkably, right, for nausea, so I, that probably wouldn't be an issue. You're a little bit tired um, after going through it. I don't know that I had two weeks of feeling bad, but certainly the week I had treatment, I didn't feel as good as then I sort of recovered, and then I would, do it again, right? But I was working through all those days. I uh, slept fine, ate pretty well. Um, sometimes people have complained of more getting like, uh, if they get a cold, a sinus infection or afterwards. And so I think I had a year or two of every time I got a cold, I got a sinus infection. And you've heard about how your immune system is tamped down for a while and does it recover. And you just deal with the doctor and the nurse about prophylactically um, protecting yourself for that. But um, I wouldn't be afraid of FCR. And uh, if that's what's available to you, um, you do it. And I think you can still go on with your life. It just becomes uh, part of a routine for several months, but there are many, many people in the room who have gone through it and uh, doing, doing really well. Thanks, Andrew. Peter? So, uh, first of all, Marcin's email is now on the screens. And um, so this is a question for Lorna. Since you have this international perspective on CLL, um, Canada, like many other countries, has a publicly funded drug system. And so there's a way that decisions are made about um, uh, whether a drug is funded. And uh, usually it involves cost effectiveness, but also demonstrating, um, uh, based on evidence, um, the merits of a particular medication. So uh, in CLL PAG, we, uh, we talk a lot about this in our board and what's coming up and what some of the issues are. But what do you see internationally? Are they similar kinds of issues? Um, you mentioned some countries are quite far behind in terms of adopting new medicines. But in those countries that have publicly funded health systems, how does Canada compare? That's actually a big question. Um, so if you're looking at publicly funded systems, you know, you're looking at mainly um, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, those, and, and there's quite a bit of diversity um, in how those systems are set up and how approvals are made. Um, you know, in Canada, we have this system called Pan-Canadian Oncology Drug Review, and, and they actually make recommendations to the provinces because the provinces hold our health budgets, right? So at the end of the day, it's up to the, the province whether they make a drug available to their residents or not. Australia has 
a national cancer system. So that decision is actually made nationally and the budget is held nationally and then they transfer the drugs as needed to the hospitals. In um, England, they, they may have NICE, but they also rely on uh, the European Medicines Association, which for um, countries that are part of the European Union, use that and they're kind of like a P-coder and they'll make recommendations and then it's still up to the countries to uh, make a decision on whether or not that will be available to their citizens. So those review processes in general are somewhat similar. A lot of them now are inviting patient input, where, which is where I say that that patient data is highly important. We've seen it actually make some good changes for, for various countries now. Um, everybody right across the board is dealing with the high cost of the medications. It's the biggest issue with getting stuff approved and actually accessible to patients is how expensive treatments are getting. And public health care systems were not necessarily set up for this kind of economic burden. And um, it's unfortunate because we obviously are advocating, we want you to get access to the best treatment for you when you need it. Um, but when um, healthcare systems can't afford to give you that medication, that's a really big issue. So how do we balance that, right? How do we work with governments to really understand how it, this is important to you and what difference it's going to make uh, for your ability to keep working or whatever that might be and contribute back to society if we can get you this treatment, especially something you could take at home rather than being hospitalized. Like those kinds of things make a big difference to patients but the cost is prohibitive. And so that's the most frequent battle that we're having, having in countries with public health care systems is trying to convince governments that uh, they should fund these drugs. A and yes, they still need to have the discussions with pharmaceutical co uh, companies about the cost, but for us as a patient, uh, for representing patients, we just want you to have access to the drugs. I have one comment. Sure. Um, I was just, just sort of wanted to add to that, sorry. Sure. You know, that's what kind of got me into the public advocacy sort of position was, uh, was when I decided to uh, introduce rituximab as part of, uh, into the venetoclax combination. I'd already had FCR. And so Cancer Care Ontario dictates that FCR, like FCR is your first line of treatment up to at least recently. And so I had already had rituximab and they wouldn't pay for rituximab again. And just, uh, my wife and I were absolutely incensed about it. Um, she's more of the social warrior <laughs> than I am, so with uh, her passion uh, wind behind me, uh, you know, we decided that, you know, it just was unreasonable. I mean, we were lucky enough that we could sort of afford it, and it was a great deal of money. It was like, you know, close to $15,000 for four doses of rituximab, and, and, but it made, for us, it was the difference between me getting to stem cell or not in a healthy manner. Um, but it was, in, it just incensed us. It incensed us that it was an approved drug. It incensed us that we had to pay for it. It, it upset me that any, any province west of Ontario paid for the drug. You know, so there isn't a balance. Uh, like, why, you know, you don't know what you don't know until you need to know it. And, you know, I didn't understand that, you know, across Canada, it's not, uh, it's not an even playing field. Every province has different availabilities, pays for things differently. And um, part of my public advocacy, I, you know, is, is to, I'd like to straighten that out. I think every province, every person in Canada should have the same opportunity to the same health medications, et cetera. And, and that's, to me, that's what's reasonable. And that's what I'd like to see change. I'd like to see, to be honest with you, I'd like to see our, our hematologists and our, our CLL specialists, the drug should be approved and it should be up to them how it's used. They're the specialists. And no bureaucracy can keep up with the changes going on, especially within CLL. And, and so by the time, by time they get around to deciding that, hey, that's a great idea, how many people have passed away already in between that time? So it just seems unreasonable to me. And I, I think the actual system needs to be changed in some way. Maybe we'll have... <laughs> Maybe we'll have national pharmacare. Who knows? Bruce? Got a question? Yeah, my comment actually goes back to the, the previous uh, question about how does fluidarabine and FCR feel. In 2007, I had just fluidarabine, so I can uh, relate my experience with fluidarabine. Um, fortunately for me, my extended health coverage covered fluidarabine by oral, so I was able to actually go to my local pharmacy, order it in. He brought it in for me, 
and the, the, the feeling of Flubert being about two hours after you took it, you got this brain fuzz. And then it's after, I'd start it on a Monday, take it till Friday, and by Thursday and Friday, it's like, okay, you have the flu, and that's how it feels like. It feels like you got the flu, and then you get through that, probably all the white cells are dying off and your body's dealing with that. So it's every regiment was the flu. So to get around the brain fuzz, um, talked to my oncologist, and what I did is instead of taking it in the morning, I took it in, in, in the afternoon or the evening, so I'd come home from work, take my fludarabine, and then by the time the brain fuzz started, I went to bed, went to sleep, got up the next morning, felt fine, and felt fine Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then Thursday is when I kind of got the flu. <laughs> and by Sunday, I was back, back uh, uh, going ahead. But the advantage of having the oral drug is I would just carry on my normal life, pick up my prescription, take it in the afternoon, go to bed, and, and in, when I was at the CLL conference in 2007, on Friday night during dinner, I had to take my chemotherapy, so I was able to take my chemotherapy and carry on with the, the dinner that evening. And that's how convenient it was having the oral drugs available and being able to order them through my local pharmacy. I didn't have to go to my cancer center and get them from them and then travel back and forth. So that was very, very convenient. So I was talking to Stephen earlier and he was saying, Steve, no, Wayne, I guess, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne. And he was talking about trying to make more oral drugs available. Uh, I guess the only risk with having oral drugs available is you are relying on the patient to take the drug exactly as prescribed, right? Mine was prescribed to take in the morning, so I consulted my oncologist and, and said, yeah, you could take it in, in the afternoon if that suits you. Thank you. Thanks. I think this is a reminder, too, that in Ontario in particular, oral cancer drugs for under 65 are not covered necessarily. So if you haven't signed the petition out at the uh, booth, please go sign it. We need all the support we can get. Thanks. Now. I wanted to respond to the gentleman who asked the question about FCR. I think everyone's experience uh, varies considerably uh, depending on the nature of your disease. In my own case, I had a, a FCR in a clinical trial in uh, 2005, and I think, relatively speaking, it was a walk in the park. Um, I was very punctilious about taking all the anti-nausea uh, medication, anti-shingles medication. A uh, couple of the cycles were delayed because the blood counts were too low, but I was given Neupogen to bring up the neutrophils. Um, the fatigue, I had fatigue perhaps one or two days after each uh, infusion, but um, beyond that I continued to work, I continued my life uh, in a sort of normal fashion. So if you're worried about it, uh, based on my own experience, I would say go ahead, it's not a big deal. Are there any more questions? We're getting close to the end now. <laughs> Oh, one more here, okay. I just started uh, Ibrutinib about four or five weeks ago. I was, uh, I'm not quite 65 yet, so I'm one of the ones that had to pay a, a deductible through Trillium because I'm Ontario resident. And after that, I'm covered, and I think I'm gonna be covered in July when I do turn 65. But my question would be, I'm with the Ontario government, there's, a chance of a change of, of leaders, and it could happen any time in the future too, and all of a sudden my funding for my drugs might be taken. What's, what's the possibility of that? I guess I can answer that. I don't think anybody has that answer. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's one of the issues, a, government, a, a provincial government change can change the rules for people. And the other thing that hasn't been brought up is there are private payers, um, so employment benefits, etc., that will cover some of these drugs, but they're getting more reluctant to pay these high prices as well, and a lot of them are capping um, payments. So you really need to look into your private payer if you have them. And um, I don't know if it, it, there's so many of them, it, it's hard to specify what's what, but you need to be aware that if you are undergoing treatment, um, that some of your private payers may help, but may help just to a limit. Yeah. 
No, the, fludarabine is available both in an, a tablet in Canada and IV. So if you have your treatment in an infusion center, in a, hosp in a hospital infusion center, then it is covered. But if you choose to take the oral pill, just because it's a lot more convenient, um, then you, if you're under 65, that is your, your cost. In, in Ontario, in Ontario, yeah. Okay, I think. The irony of that is that if you're not in the hospital and you take oral, you're not taking up the facility in the hospital, it's less money for the government. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. make any sense, but a lot of this does make sense. Yeah. But you do so have like to, to remember, right, those are different budgets, and I'm not trying to advocate for the system in any way because it is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, if you go into the government and your, your argument is, well, if you, you saving costs over here, then you can use them here, their answer is those are different budgets. It doesn't work that way here, right? So, um, we, and I will be honest, we, we are well aware of patients who have moved provinces so they could get access to a treatment that they needed because it was free in another province. So they would move, they would take the delay of, you, you know, you can't just move in and get into another healthcare system. There is a, you have to live there a little bit. So they'll take that delay in starting their treatment so that they can get access to a therapy. And that sucks, right? Because you not only are you leaving your home, you're leaving your support system. And that is not a fair way to be treated for your cancer. I, I'm really into this for the US, but globally about access issues. So I just want to, this relates to advocacy. So you have your own private battle, but you can also speak up, like you working with the Ontario government. And the media will sometimes highlight a patient's struggle in a system because the system is screwed up, right? And so this is very public and sometimes legislators. So I would uh, urge you on our website, patientpower.info, you can become a patient power ambassador and say where you are, what drugs you're taking and offer yourself as a public speaker, if you will, to the media or to legislators. And so as these battles shape up that are sometimes very local, per country, per province, per city, um, raise your hand, you know, because your story can be one that could turn the tide along with these surveys, the quantitative surveys that they want to. Yeah. And you can bring it up with your candidates. The upcoming election in Ontario is a perfect Exactly. Perfectly be perfect. active. So when you're looking at who you're going to vote for in the Ontario election, also look at what their stance is on healthcare, right? So not just what they want to put out in, in the media, but really dig down and ask pertinent questions to your own health so you know what you're actually voting for when you're making a decision. Um, the, often health charities help with that. They'll start releasing information about what they see, about what candidates are proclaiming, and, and uh, what they're actually the details. So look for those, and if you can't find it, then call the candidates and ask very specific questions so you're actually making a really good choice for your health, as well as the, as the other issues that we're looking at when we get a new government in place. I think we're going to call this top there because we're cutting into the hematology panel time. But any of you, if you have questions, are welcome to approach us individually, please, to get them answered. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to our panel.